All right, everybody. Today we're going to talk about the Nichromat FTN, one of the most significant 35 millimeters SLRs on the used market today. Um, this is the most affordable, one of the best ways to get into a Nikon system is by purchasing a Nichromat FTN and having it overhauled. Um, the level of engineering and build quality you are getting with this camera is simply unparalleled. Let's talk a little bit about the history. The FTN was introduced in 1967 and it ran until 1972 for a five year production run. Can you see that? There we go. 67 to 72. <laughs> Approximately 1 million Nichromat FTNs were produced during this uh, roughly five year production run. It was preceded by the Nichromat FT. Uh, there is no functional advantage to an FT over an FTN and generally FTs sell for the same if not a little bit more than the FTNs because they have a little bit of collector value because they were the first, um, shall we say, prosumer, what, what today we would call prosumer Nikon SLR. Um, so for the collector shooter, I would suggest skipping the FT. Uh, the FTN was followed by the FT2. There is, there is a good reason you may want an FT2 rather than an FTN. I've done a separate video on the FT2. Take a look at that. You can distinguish the models by the top plate on the left hand side. So for example, here we can see that the serial number is down here. It's preceded by the letters FT. Um, and the letter N appears above the uh, meter readout window. Um, if this were an FT, it would simply not have the N and the, and the, the serial number would begin FT. If it were an FT2 or FT3, then it would say FT2 or FT3 right here. Um, so that's how you distinguish those various models because they do look rather similar. Um, the FTN was the only non-professional body which was made by Nikon throughout its production run. So while the FTN was in production, the only other camera you could get from Nikon was the Nikon F, or in 1971, I believe the F2 was introduced. I think that's right, I believe it was 1971. Um, but, uh, but during this time period, the Nikon F was simply known as the Nikon and the Nichromat was referred to as the Nichromat. It wasn't called the Nikon Nichromat, it was simply the Nichromat. Um, it, was br it was separately branded by Nikon. Um, except in the, in the Japanese home market, it was called the Nikomat. So you see this particular camera was originally made for the Japanese home market. We know this because it bears the Nikomat um, branding as opposed to um, models for all other markets which were branded Nikormat. Uh, but it was treated as a separate brand by Nippon Kogaku, which was the parent company at the time, uh, which subsequently changed its name to Nikon, but at the time was Nippon Kogaku. The camera features a no plastic exterior. If you take a look at the FTN, you will not find a bit of plastic on here anywhere. This is glass, this is glass, rewind crank is um, all metal, no plastic covering the uh, advanced lever. Um, if you look on the, uh, the front of the camera, likewise, all the buttons, all the interfaces, everything, the, uh, this, that's metal, 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 it's all metal. Um, you've got uh, the eyepiece is also metal. Um, the vulcanite or the fake leather, whatever you want to call this stuff is, um, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's not what we would call plastic. It's some, I don't know what the heck it is. Um, but in order to see plastic, you've got to open this thing up. And if I do open it up, which I'm going to do by pulling down this catch right here, you know, opening up the back of the camera. If I open it up, I can see plastic. Okay, I can see the, um, the rewind, excuse me. These surfaces are plastic. The take up spool is plastic. Um, the advance um, um, roller, that's plastic. Um, the guide rails appear to be, well, I think that's plastic. Um, so yeah, so there is plastic inside the camera, but you've got to open it up to see a bit of plastic. This is an extremely well-made machine. Um, it is also not small, nor is it light. So it is a big, heavy, extremely well-made um, piece of brass, aluminum, steel. Um, it's, it's a quality piece of, of, of equipment. At the time it was introduced, 
the sold for with a list price. I found an issue of Modern Photography from December 1969, uh, which gave the list price with a 50 millimeter f2 as $269.50, um, or with a 514 as $331.50, which are equivalent to uh, $2,043 and $2,513, according to some website, which I just found and did no, no checking to see if that's accurate. So. Um, take it for what it's worth, but this, I mean, essentially you're buying what would, what today would be a $2,000 prosumer SLR. Um, that's, that's the level of quality that you're getting into when you, when you buy one of these things. Um, let me go through the features just real quickly. So, uh, so you have an idea of what's what on top of the camera, we've got the shutter release button is here. Film advance lever right there. Um, this is not the shutter release. This is the depth of field preview. It's an odd placement, but that is nonetheless the depth of field preview. We have the auto reset um, uh, frame advance counter right there. Um, you've got that red dot, which tells you that the meter is on. Well, it would be on if there were a battery in it, but there's not. So you've got the, the advance lever at the standoff position here. You can retract it. You can put it uh, uh, flush with the body like so. Even retracted, the, f the um, shutter will fire. There is no shutter lockout device on this camera as there is on the, um, the FM and FE series. Uh, here's your rewind crank right there. Um, and here is a meter readout window, which is useful if you do a lot of work on tripods. Personally, I don't, but it is a neat feature. Not too many cameras have that. Um, You've got the, let's see here, on the front of the camera, this is your self timer. Here is the uh, lens release button. Here is your mirror lockup function right there. And this is the, um, th this is how you change shutter speeds with this right here. One of the quirks of this camera is that you've got a lot going on in this area here. Uh, you change shutter speeds um, around the collar. You also change the ASA setting right here underneath the camera. There's a bracket right there that moves. This is a little fidgety um, and some models is gonna be really tight and others a little bit looser on this particular one. It's kind of tight and it does take a little bit of fidgeting around with your fingernails to, um, to get it set just right. Um, but that's just one of the quirks. I've done a separate video on the Nikromat quirks. There, there are certain quirks these cameras are known for. So take a look at that for, uh, to get into that in a little more detail. Um, you open the camera with the, uh, with the latch here, as I demonstrated earlier. Uh, film loading is fairly conventional. I've done a separate video on loading film into a uh, into actually this specific camera. So I have a look at that video concerning the issue of uh, loading film. And you'll see that this is a fairly, even despite its quirks, this is a fairly conventional camera. Um, it does take the pre-AI series of lenses, that is to say, um, if I remove the lens, I first of all, I have it set at f5.6, press, <laughs> get this, make sure that's out of the way, press the lens release, remove the lens, and to mount it, again, I want to make, I want to mount it using the pre-AI mounting procedure, click, there we go. Uh, I've done a separate video on mounting and removing uh, pre-AI lenses, um, and, a not, and actually, a, um, um, another video which talks about uh, the difference between an AI and an AI converted lens. Um, I don't want to get into the details here. I have done separate videos. Please see that if you are not familiar with the concept of pre-AI and AI, what, is, what, what that means when you're talking about Nikon cameras, you do need to know that if you're, if you're contemplating getting into a classic Nikon system. Essentially, in, in terms of lens compatibility with the light meter, this camera will accept any lens that has the mounting prong. Mounting prong is this this little gizmo here. Sometimes you see it referred to as the dog ears or the rabbit ears, uh, but any lens which, which is equipped with the mounting prong is fully compatible with the metering system of the Nikromat FTN. If the, if the lens does not have a metering prong, it will still mount, but you'll have to um, meter in the stop down mode. Um, all right, let's take a, let's talk a little bit about the features of the camera, the specs, if you will. So the specs are fairly, um, 
unremarkable for the period. This is what you would get if, uh, on uh, most of the so-called built like a tank SLRs of, uh, of the 1960s. Shutter speeds uh, from one second to one one thousandth plus bulb. Bulb simply means that the shutter will remain open for as long as the um, uh, shutter release button is depressed. Uh, it, is, it has a stainless steel vertically traveling copal square shutter. Uh, it is a mechanical shutter which will fire on all speeds without a battery. The battery only powers the light meter. Other than that, uh, the, 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 all features of the camera work without the battery other than the light meter. Uh, the camera features depth of field preview, a self timer and mirror lockup. These were considered premium features back during that era. Um, the metering pattern, it has a, the Nikon 6040 center weighted uh, metering pattern which in my personal opinion is as close to perfection as one can get for a, a, uh, um, a metering pattern, center weighted pattern, um, just my opinion. It has uh, two cadmium sulfide photo cells, which again was typical of the 1960s. Uh, and it was built to run on PX625 series mercury batteries. That's a big challenge with these cameras. Um, and it has pre-AI meter coupling, which I talked about just a moment ago. So the mercury battery issue can be a problem with these cameras um, because it's actually hard to find one nowadays that has a good calibrated light meter. So my suggestion is don't bother. If you're looking into a Nikromat FTN, uh, my recommendation is think of the FTN as um, a raw material. Um, buy the nicest one you can afford which is capable of being restored and then find someone to restore it and get it refurbished. Um, just get it overhauled in and out and during the overhaul process make sure that the technician um, installs a resistor so that you can use 1.5 volt batteries. Um, the batteries are the battery actually takes one battery not batteries so you've got the little battery cover here you see that um, that uh, zero right there is actually the letter O meaning open so I'm going to twist about a quarter turn clockwise to open the battery compartment. This is going to open up like so, and I'm going to insert um, one of these. This, these um, funny looking batteries uh, of this shape were all originally designed, uh, were all originally made with mercury, or mercury oxide, I suppose. Um, mercury something. Anyway, you can't buy mercury based batteries anymore for. Um, uh, just, they just—they were outlawed for either environmental or workplace safety reasons. I don't, I'm not sure which, perhaps both. Uh, but you can get these things, and this, this is a an alkaline replacement cell. Um, it's shaped exactly like the, the original mercury batteries, but it's an alkaline cell. The only difference is, and the, the important difference is, the voltage. Um, these alkaline cells produce 1.5 volts, whereas the original mercury batteries produced 1.35 volts. So, um, if you use the wrong voltage, it will throw off the light meter. And so it, as you're getting your FTN overhauled, it is a simple matter for the technician to install a resistor so that the, um, um, so the light meter will give you accurate readings. But that would be my recommendation. Um, because these cameras are so incredibly well built, once you have this thing serviced and running back to spec, you can probably use it for the rest of your life with little to no maintenance. I mean, they're that good. These cameras are that well built. Um, and that's why you might want to consider investing in one. Um, there are less expensive options that are electronic and have auto exposure and offer uh, all sorts of uh, bells and whistles. But if you want something that you can fix once and be confident that you won't have to mess with it again, Nicromat. Nicrom a mechanical Nicromat. You just can't beat it. You really can't in terms of the of the um, uh, the money you'll pay. I mean, you can get these in really beautiful condition for fifty dollars. You can get one in in you know fixable condition for twenty or thirty dollars um, U.S. prices. And um, there are still quite a few technicians around who know how to work on these things because there were so many built. Um, they were well cared. They were well cared for. They they're still around, um, and um, there are still people out there who can fix them. My suggestion is. One of the best ways into the Nikon system, get the uh, get a, a an FTN in fixable condition, find a good tech, and and make the investment. Um, okay, I think that covers most of the aspects of the um, of the Nikromat. I've done separate videos on a number of other issues, which I think I've linked to. Um, I just want to say a word about pricing because I found this interesting. I wanted to. Um, 
I wanted to give you some examples of the pricing of this camera um, uh, so to sort of give you an idea of what um, you know what, what you're buying for you know for fifty dollars or whatever. So here's a picture. Excuse me. Here's a, a copy of the January 1969 issue of uh, the American magazine um, Popular Photography, and. During that period, at the, in the back of the magazine, you would see the major retailers advertising uh, their specials for, um, uh, you know, for various uh, models of camera and so on and so forth. So here's Ritz, okay, big retailer in the United States during the period. And let's take a look at their Nicromat FTN ad right here, okay. So you can get a Nicromat FTN, but what's the price? Well, it's eighty-four dollars ninety-five cents, and your Nicromat FT body. Um, isn't that interesting? You got to trade in your Nicromat FT body, uh, Nicromat FT and latest model. If you trade in your Nikon F body, then it's sixty-nine dollars. If you trade in your Nicromat FS body, it's one hundred seven dollars, or your Nicorex F body, one nineteen ninety-five. So there's no straight price given for the Nicromat FTN. Interestingly. Um, you got to, and that's the only brand like that. The other brands um, uh, in, the, uh, in the magazine do not require, do not contemplate a trade-in. I found that interesting. Um, if we keep going over to, here we go, here's Wall Street. Here's another, here's another major um, uh, retailer of the period. And where is the Nikon? Nikon uh, here we go. So here's Wall Street's. Nicromat FTN. Here we go, right there. And this is brand new with spot meter EE. EE stands for electric eye. That's what they called built-in meters back then. No kidding. Uh, so if you give your, your plus a Nikon F trade body for body, it's $69.95. Uh, or $89.50 with a Nicromat FT trade-in. Or $109 with a Nicromat FS trade-in. Or $139 plus your Nicorex F. So again, um, no, um, no separate price for the Nicromat. The, 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 but both of these companies contemplate a trade-in for your Nicromat, which I've found really interesting. Um, if I go over to another major retailer, uh, not Olden, let's keep going. The uh, I've found it interesting that many of the here we go. This is Bass Photo. Okay, Bass Photo News. Here we go. So in the Nikon section, I've got prices for the Nikon Photomic TN, which is the Nikon F, um, the Nicromat FT with a 51.4, Nicromat FT with a 50F2, Nicromat FT body. No FTNs. This is the old model. Even in early 1969, uh, they were still advertising the um, the older models. Not the um, uh, not there, there's no there's no listing for the Nicromat FTN. Uh, at this particular retailer, um, and there's another one. Here we go to Cambridge. Okay, Cambridge Photo. That's another big New York, another big New York retailer. Um, if I take a look at the Nikon ad here, uh, I got a price for the Nikon F Atomic TN, but I don't have a price for the Nikromat. Uh, excuse me. I've got the Nikromat FT, FT with 50 F2, FT with a 51.4, but no price for the Nikromat FTN. So in this in this magazine, which is the January 1969, here we go, the January 1969 issue of, there it is, Popular Photography, there's no uh, price given for simply a Nicromat FTN. All the advertisements contemplate a trade-in, and that's unique amongst, um, amongst the brands. Uh, only Nikon is, is treated in that fashion. So um, that kind of tells you a little bit about what Nikon was back in the day. Um, Nikon was, they were it. Nikon was the big fish. They really were. Um, and people took care of their Nikon equipment and they traded up and they traded in. And um, it, um, it was a, uh, this was a serious piece of machinery. And it still is. And it can be yours for next to nothing compared to, to um, what people paid for these things, you know, half a century ago. Um, okay, so I think that's going to do it for my Nicromat FTN review. I've said what I have to say about this camera. It's an excellent, excellent um, entry point into the Nikon system. I cannot say enough about it. 
Uh, so I'll just stop talking since, <laughs> since I can't say more about it. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. As a courtesy to subscribers, I do not monetize my videos for 30 days following release. So if you would like to see all of my content commercial, commercial free, um, please uh, subscribe and hit the bell and uh, you can see all my content commercial free for 30 days. Thanks. Please check out the links down below and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.